Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the afternoon session of the second day of our conference, looking at cultural diplomacy in the European Union. I'm very, very happy to have the privilege and the honor of introducing our next keynote speaker, Mr. Morten Messerschmidt, member of the European Party uh, Parliament, uh, also from the Danish People's Party. Allow me to say a few words of introduction about Mr. Messerschmidt. Mr. Messerschmidt graduated with a degree of law from the University of Copenhagen in 2009. Since 1997, he has been an active member of the Danish People's Party. After the elections for the European Parliament in 2004, he was the party's second alternate in the European Parliament and, until the Danish elections in 2005, worked as a political assistant for the party in the European Parliament. In the Danish parliamentary elections in 2005, he was elected as the party's second mandate in Eastern Jutland and was re-elected in the 2007 cycle. From 2005 until 2009, he was the political spokesperson on EU affairs for the Danish People's Party. In 2009, he moved from national politics into the European sphere and was overwhelmingly elected to the European Parliament as an MEP from the Danish People's Party. His lecture topic today will be European Identity, Possibility or Limitation? Question mark. If you could please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Mr. Morten Messerschmidt. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for that introduction and uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity uh, to come here and elaborate a bit upon the uh, highly important topic that you are um, emphasizing here in your uh, conference. I think the subject is uh, one of the most interesting, especially because the European identity as a bureaucratic and ideological project uh, right now facing the serious challenges in the wake of the euro crisis. Uh, handling the euro and the European debt crisis will show us whether the European identity is viable and whether such a thing can be said at all to exist. I'm speaking to you, as it was mentioned by in the introduction here, as a Danish politician. Um, um, and I must say to that, uh, only in a second row as a European parliamentarian. Denmark is one of the small member states in the European Union. Our language is quite rare and only has about 5.2 million native speakers. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why the Danes sometimes feel that they are living under a kind of siege. We don't speak one of the great languages of the Union. We have to learn foreign languages, which prove to be a substantial challenge compared to, let's say, for instance, uh, native English speakers, who have a profound advantage on the international scene. Um, however, I will promise to continue in English. Um, and when asking the uh, question uh, about whether or not a European identity is a possibility or a limitation, as we have uh, made it today's topic, I think we have to take a closer look uh, at Europe in general and the European uh, Union in particular. First of all, looking at uh, Europe as a geographic entity is beyond uh, doubt. The Eurasian Peninsula um, has proved to be one of the cradles of the Western civilization when it comes to philosophy, thinking and science but also, alas, uh, when it comes to the worst crimes in the history of mankind. Normally, uh, we consider the geographic uh, boundaries of Europe uh, to be the area west of the Ural Mountains uh, in Russia and stretching from the Caspian Sea to the Iberian Peninsula in the west. But in my view, it's highly irrelevant to speak about one European identity within these borders because Europe is fortunate in presenting a multitude of different cultures and identities. It's exactly the unconscious competition between these different cultures and countries which in the past has created the dynamics to transform this relatively small continent into one of the most influential parts of the world. The question we have to ask ourselves is therefore whether the European Union as such in a historic compare is strengthening or weakening these dynamic historical processes. The European Union was founded on the idea of lasting peace uh, on the ruins of the Second World War. 
Uh, the idea was supported by the United States, and the primary wish was to create a stable peace with the European countries cooperating instead of fighting each other. That's a great idea. It's a brilliant idea. And uh, so far, we must admit that the idea has been good in the sense that we have not had these wars since 1945. Five, except, of course, of the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia Republic, whose establishment proved to be one, uh, one worst result of the aftermath of the First World War. Yugoslavia proved that the question about identity and sovereignty can't be ignored without significant consequences. The question about creating a European identity has posed one of the greatest challenges to the European Union, and the enlargement of the Union has only made the task even greater. The European Union has given us a national anthem, a flag, open borders uh, within the framework of the Schengen Agreement, and has in 17 countries also presented itself with a common currency, the euro. But the question remains whether Euro the European countries and peoples reached the necessary level of maturity to handle this common identity, mainly created by bureaucrats behind desks in the office building in Brussels. Wouldn't such, a measure, uh, wouldn't such measures normally require years of preparations, creating a sound and functioning fundament which reaches all the way down to the common people of the member countries? Do ordinary Danes, Greeks and Germans share the same outlook and wishes for the future, or does the idea of solidarity fail to reach beyond the, the, offices, uh, the office towers in Brussels? An identity and, more importantly, a sense of solidarity cannot be created by artificial means, but has to grow from the bottom up. Just take a look at the almost failed nation here in Belgium. I know that it succeeded in getting a government recently, but I must say, um, with its perpetual rivalry between French speakers and Dutch speakers, which has for, uh, for um, more than uh, almost two years prevented the establishment of federal government, it's hard to deem a success. One of the important representatives of this country, the European president, Herman Van Rompuy, recently declared that we are living in what he called a post-national era. This might be the case for the artificial state of Belgium, but when I travel to my own country or most other European uh, countries and visit many common Europeans, I'm faced with a nationally based reality and everyday life. People do not care about Europe as a construction, but care about their family, their future, and their country. And of course, they primarily stick to information in their own language, which proves that the nation state so far is the only viable framework for democracy in a broader sense. Democracy requires a living debate, and this debate mainly takes place on a national level. If we try to imagine a European democracy, it would at least imply that I, as a Dane, can take part in, a Rom in Romanian debates and that an Irishman is aware of discussions in Germany or Spain. Otherwise, democracy is degenerated into a matter for a small elite, and this would mean the end of democracy as we know it and we cherish it. As you, of course, know, I am not and I guess that might be the reason why you invited me today, I am not one of those firm believers in this common European identity, mainly because I see it as a limitation and a kind of straitjacket for our continent. I am not solely satisfied with an identity as a European, and why should the identity be preserved to people here living actually in Europe? Still, most of the citizens of the United States, the Aust Australia, and New Zealand, Zealand would uh, fairly consider themselves to be European, at least on their family history, which means that these countries should also be a part of the European project. That's if, uh, that's if we ignore the geographic uh, uh, thing for a moment, of course. And is ge geography really that important in a highly complicated and modern society where money and goods are transferred at the speed of light and where the term global village has become the common? 
is the European Union a means of development for the future, or is the same European Union on a longer term risking the fate of ending up as an advanced kind of open-air museum which is visited by stunning Japanese, Chinese and Indian tourists who are amazed at the facilities and social transfer, but who at the same time shake their heads and smile to themselves. I fear that the European Union will develop into a national jacket while other strong nations are taking over. Go to China, go to India, and you'll soon discover that they are proud to be Chinese, they're proud to be Indians. They don't even question their identity. Can a country then survive without national pride? That's the question. Can a continent survive without a national pride? The European Union is a highly, in my view, a highly schizophrenic identity. On the one hand, it tries to create a kind of national identity on a supranational level. But on the other hand, the European Union has been put into the world in order to suppress any national feeling because such feelings are suspected of leading to new wars, we are told. European children are no longer taught to take pride in the accomplishments of their fellow countrymen, and patriotism has been banned from the curricula, curricula as most, uh, in most member states. But who is going to risk his life fighting for an organization like the EU? Will parents sacrifice their sons for the star-spangled European flag? I doubt it. Scholars constantly teach us that all identities are artificial in the sense that they are imposed on people by the means of storytelling. In other words, identity is a matter of social construction, we are told, be that as it may. But history has proved that some constructions seem to work better than others in the sense that they create the solidarity which is a precondition for civilization. In my imagination, I already hear a Europhile crying out loudly that nationalist constructions automatically lead to wars. Just look at Germany from 33 to 45. That's what we hear, isn't it? Well, I have to disappoint you on here. United as late as 1871, Germany was exactly lacking a common feeling of national identity. Bismarck and Hitler used wars as a means to create this common identity between as highly different peoples as the Prussians, the Bavarians, and the Rhinelanders. In other words, war, in other words was war used as, as a means to fuse people together whose only common feature was that they all spoke some kind of German. Every attempt to create an artificial identity is bound to fail. That's what history shows us. Identity is not a matter of bureaucratic maneuvers, but a matter of feeling. To say it clearly, identity is a feeling in your stomach and in your heart. A new generation in Europe is now growing up, and this generation has no memory of the Second World War and will not automatically subscribe to the idea of a European Union as the only means to prevent future wars. In my country, for instance, the youth organization of the pro-EU parties are turning against the EU country um, or the EU uh, uh, ideology, causing a lot of anxiety uh, in their mother parties. For example, the youth organization of the very pro-EU conservative party that is here in this parliament in the group EPP is now turning its back on the Danish membership of the Union. The Euro and the debt crisis has to a great extent buttressed the EU skeptical movement throughout the continent. The lack of real success story has shaken the foundation of the Union. Who wants to join a common currency which has only worsened and to some extent caused the economical crisis in countries like Greece, Ireland or Spain? And who wants to give up sovereignty and hand it over to faceless bureaucrats in Brussels? Who really wants to, uh, the from above dictated, open borders between the countries which have only facilitated the lives of criminals and human, trafficking, human, human traffickers? If anybody wanted it, well, let's have a public referendum. On the other hand, I have to give the European Union some credit as well. The Union has made people aware of their own national identity, not as a negative feeling, but positively. Alas, in most member countries, the people are not even asked whether they want to give up their national sovereignty. It has instead become a decision for the elected politicians, for the elite and the technocrats. In my party, we happen to love the original idea of the common market. 
In our point of view, the, future, uh, the further development towards more integration should have come to a grinding halt at this point. Harmonization of the market, facilitating the exchange of goods and money, was an important contribution to the welfare of the European people. But at that point, the EU should not have developed further. Harmonization and the creation of viable framework for the free trade is a good, as good as integration is bad. A lot of decisions are not any longer taken by the national parliaments, but have become part of EU legislation, thereby castrating the nationally elected governments and stripping them of important powers. The EU should, in my view, from the beginning, have put limits to itself. Instead, it created a life and logic on its own and was thus drifting further away from the ordinary people and their everyday life. Like any other organization, the European Union's primary goal is to gain power and become more influential. As since no one is standing above the European Union, this organization practically controls itself. The ideology has gone so far that if you are against the European Union, you'll be labeled a lunatic or nutcase how can you be against something which is evidently good and right, will be asked. This paradigm has for the past 20 years dominated the national debate on the EU in my home country and in many other countries around on the continent. And it leaves the opponents in a somewhat marginalized position. Yet the Danish people showed both spite and courage when they voted no to the Maastricht Treaty in 1992 and rejected, thank God, the Euro in 2000, against the will of most political parties, economical experts, trade unions and other organizations. The European Union has failed to create a European identity. This can't um, be considered to be any kind of loss. On the contrary, the Union has strengthened the multitude of identities in Europe and it's, it's exactly this multitude which forms the only possible future if Europe is going to survive in a world with strong global competition. The European Union strangles the dynamics of this competition in creating a bureaucratic monster which weighs heavily on the free market. And the European Union has not removed a single barrier without creating new barriers. For example, the custom wall with which the Union surrounds itself and with an outdated agricultural policy which is still the largest post on the budget. The European Union fears the free market and real global competition, which also explains the poor growth rate and round in Europe. We are running the risk of being taken over by stronger and more dynamic economies while we lose ourselves in futile dis uh, discussions about the future of Europe. But let's touch upon the central issue of the discussion once more. I'd rather think of a Western civilization or identity than a strictly, than a strictly European identity as such. In fact, this is also one of the reasons why it's so hard to imagine a country like Turkey to join the European uh, Union. If a Turkish membership was an option, I don't see why Russia or Israel shouldn't be ex should be excluded from a membership. The European Union has lost its sense of real identity and only created a superficial and artificial identity, a hollow identity without meaning. Times to come will show us how strong the sense of identity and solidarity of this European project really is. The euro is one of the strongest symbols of the European storytelling. The fate of the euro is ultimately connected to the fate of the European Union as an ideological project. If the euro fails, Europe fails. At least this seems to be the logic of the European elite in Brussels. But in my point of view, the abolition or reform of the common currency could be the beginning of a new historical process which would force the Union back on the right track, returning sovereignty to the peoples instead of putting them under administration. Speaking about the creation of an identity, it would be hazardous to omit the American experiment, uh, when the melting, uh, experience when the melting pot was created out of immigrants from a vast variety of different cultures and nations. When the Europhiles are daydreaming, I am sure they are imagining something similar for Europe, a melting pot of different cultures turning into a European identity. Well, this is not the case to happen for several reasons. First of all, Europe 
has only recently become a destination for immigrants, and too often it is not even their goal to become European, but to preserve their culture and keep their own family structure intact. Often the social welfare systems facilitate this kind of cultural conservatism. Integration is not a must, only a possibility. Secondly, immigrants to the United States had their minds set on a new kind of life and were united by a common wish for freedom and democracy. Europe, as a contrary, consists of ancient nation states, each with its own particular history. These nations have often been at war with each other and each and every one of them represents something unique. It's this patchwork of individual nations which the European Union tries to unite under a single European identity, which to my knowledge has hardly ever existed. Therefore, the identity project is bound to fail. And even if it did succeed, I would rather consider it a limitation than a possibility. Thereby, I hope that I have given some inspiration to the debate today, and at least answered some of the questions that were raised in the topic. Thank you. All European uh, countries are facing challenges with the migration flux that have uh, been going on for the past 20 or 30 years. Some countries are very successful in the process of integration, some aren't. Um, I'm not going to be the judge of the, uh, the Belgian integration policies. Uh, what I meant when I made the compare between the European Union and the history of, the, of, of America is that America basically consists of migrants. I mean, there, there is the native uh, people of, uh, of America lives in camps. So it, the, the very history of America is so different compared to, to Europe, where uh, we as individuals can identify our family and our, and, and our country history back maybe even more than a thousand years. Um, so what I want to say is that in Europe, Migration is a relatively new phenomenon that has caused many problems that are important and, and, and we can discuss, but are not at all as significant to the creation of the European identity, if there is such a thing, as it has been in America, where everybody are, uh, have a mi migrant uh, background. Um, and we very often hear that as the United States of America could work, why shouldn't it work in Europe? And I think the individual background of the populations in America uh, are so different and ha has created an entirely different identity compared to what we have in Europe that you can't make this compare. So when I mention it, it is as a comment to these remarks normally being made as, as since they could build up a new identity in America, we can do the same here. No, we won't, because people are from an old history, generation after generation, have built their own identity. And that's not just to, to erase, even though, if you, even though how much the bureaucrats in this house might dream about it. I have a question. Uh, I'd just like you to clarify the statement you made about the indigenous people of America, the native population living in camps. And one other question. Uh, it's a well-known fact that your party has been dubbed racist and xenophobic. Uh, would you like to uh, comment on that and the encouragement, perhaps, of neo-Nazi movements in 
in the Scandinavian as a whole? Well, I'm just referring to the fact that the original population of America, the Indians of North America, um, have very limited facilities to uh, facilities to, uh, to to live as they uh, as they uh, used to, and they were very uh, brutally uh, removed at the uh, at the uh, migration, you can say, from from Europe in the uh, 14th and 15th uh, century. Um, that's about the American history. My party, well, you know, when a new party comes up um, and gets votes, these votes come from other parties. And these other parties don't like to lose their votes. So they come up with whatever accusations and uh, um, uh, hateful remarks, uh, as you've mentioned some. Uh, you're racist, you're xenophobic, and things like that. Uh, I simply don't agree that it's uh, anything to do with racism or xenophobia to be critical or even against the migration that's developed uh, in Europe for the past 20 or uh, 30 years. I think it's extremely important to have an open and frank discussion on these uh, politics policies, especially since uh, a huge amount of the European population is concerned about the development of their uh, societies. And what we regrettably have seen in some Scandinavian countries, where I'm proud to say this is not the case for Denmark, where I'm, where I'm from, is that the neglect and the suppression of this free discussion on migration has led to these awful extreme organizations that you, that you mentioned. If you don't have a free and open discussion, people who have these feelings and sentiments, they feel suppressed. They feel that they will be uh, marginalized and suppressed by the public opinion. And that makes them and provokes them into hateful and idiotic uh, actions. And that's what we've seen. Um, and I hope that the lesson from that will be that you cannot suppress a discussion, especially not such, especially not, uh, such a fundamental one as to the uh, demographics or the migrations or the, w the way that your, that your society and country develops. Uh, these are core issues that have to be addressed by political parties. Um, and if not, people react. Threat or uh, fear doesn't go away just because you ignore it. and I was curious as to how you see um, this being different than the present European identity. I think there are many common values that keep us together uh, in the Western civilization. I regard myself as a, as a child of the, of the uh, Renaissance world with the uncompromised will to question the authorities, even the church, the politicals, well, even this house. Um, that's what I see as a uh, Western civilization, the undogmatic approach to life, where we don't just believe whatever we are told by the Pope or the King or whoever. We have the right to question, we have the right to uh, critique, and we do that very proudly. That's at least some fundamental thing that keeps us together in, uh, uh, I think, in the entire Western uh, world, which is sadly lacking in other cultures. And I hope that what we're seeing the present development, of course, in North Africa might lead to some of the same uh, values. I hope. I fear that it won't, but I hope. Um, but you can look at it as a pyramid, I think, where you have the broadest base in the bottom, and that's what we all share. But the more, the closer we get to the individual, we could say that the lowest level is the civilization, the Western civilization. The next level will be the continent. The next will be the nation state. The following will be your region. Then you'll have your city, your family, and yourself. And the narrower it gets, the more individual it gets. Uh, and that's how I see Western culture. But where we have the European identity, which I regard as 100% artificial, because you don't have the the common language, the common identity, the common perception of reality, which is necessary when you are at the uh, narrowing in on the identity, I'd say somewhat in the middle of the pyramid. When you don't have that, well, the idea of identity stops. And that's how I see that we have some fundamental values in the West, not necessarily a common identity, but common values. Um, 
but creating the new identity as the European Union is trying to do simply uh, compromises this logic. Is that so somewhat distinct clear? Yeah. Thanks. I have uh, maybe a rather personal question. What was your, because from what you said, I got that you're, well, not against the EU project, but the further EU integration. And um, what was your personal drive then to run for, um, for the parliament, for the European parliament? And how does that influence your work? Because uh, on a daily basis, you work with, uh, with MEPs from other countries, not so you cannot actually represent the Danish, uh, the, yeah, Danish view uh, itself. I think this uh, entire house should be shut down. We have 27 perfectly well-functioning parliaments, and there's certainly no reason to have this joke running around. But each time I wake up in the morning, I actually live just down Place Chaudin. I can see the European Parliament from here, and I check out my window before I go to work, and I can confess, all right, it's still there. I have to go. So that's the answer. As long as the European Parliament's here, as long as the European institutions are here, and they are acting vividly, creating laws, then I think that my party, as long as it has the support of sufficient voters, must be represented here. So that's why I ran. I'd rather not have the possibility at all, uh, and I will go back then to the National Party where I used to serve, um, sorry, National Parliament. But as long as it's here, um, I think my party, as any other party that can you know, get together the sufficient amount of votes, need to be here. Um, then how do I do on a daily, on a daily basis? Well, I think I do well, because I, but, but I must, I, I understand the, um, the, uh, the question, the reason for the question, that um, how can you, being in opposition to the entire masquerade, masquerade here, how can you then uh, work? Well, you can say I politically have a split personality. On the one hand, I am the hardcore opposition to this house, and I speak that out very clearly, but on the other hand, I also accept uh, reports, spokesmanships, and so on, and work at, with that, as I did in the National Parliament, because if I don't do the work, then one of my opponents, uh, opponents will do it. Right now, I'm working on a report on the implementation of uh, EU legislation in 27 countries. I think that's a very important thing, because if not all countries implement the EU law at the same time and at the same level, well, it creates differences in the competition. So I've taken this task upon me, and I think it's important. As I also stressed in my introduction, I'm, I'm fundamentally in favor of the inner market and, and the doing business together, and this has to work. So, and so far for the past two and a half years, it's worked. On the one hand, to critique the uh, principal ideas of the European Union, because I think we could do much better than we have today. Um, but on the other hand, realizing that the European Union is here, and as long as that's the case, then I will try to do my influence. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think at this point we do need to bring it to a conclusion just in the name of time, but I'd ask you to take this opportunity to please express our gratitude to Mr. Morton Messerschmidt. Thank you. My pleasure.